Welcome back everyone. I am Error and today uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, I thought I would start a series uh, about uh, EDH decks. Uh, specifically I thought I would take some of my favorite EDH decks, um, sort of break them down, um, sort of show you some of the cards that I chose and why I chose them, uh, what some of the synergies are, um, and then some alternate strategies and alternate cards, um, sort of substitute things in to more compensate for your play style or budget. Um, just sort of try to give like a comprehensive look of what makes this particular deck tick. Um, so today uh, I'm going to start with my current favorite EDH deck and probably the most powerful one that I have, uh, which is going to be Maldrotha the Gravetide. And as you can see, I have the shiny version of the commander, which you'll notice is a theme. So, um, I'm just going to sort of break it out. We'll start with the mana curve and we'll see what it all looks like laid out. All right, so we got the whole deck laid out here, and uh, one thing you'll notice about this particular deck is the mana curve is extremely low for a commander deck, and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one, really with Maldrotha, I thought the best way to maximize her ability is to get her out as quickly as you can and then start trying to double or triple or even quadruple spell a turn if you can. Um, so I tried to be very diverse with the permanent types that I put in, tried to have a decent mix of creatures, artifacts, enchantments, planeswalkers, so I could cast multiple things in a turn, and I tried to keep the cost down on a lot of those spells if possible. Now, you'll notice a lot of the cards I'm playing still have a very high impact once you realize that all of them, almost all of them, are completely reusable. Um, as one-off effects, it'd be a pretty underwhelming deck. Um, but if you can get Muldrotha out and you can get her to stick, you can abuse a lot of these cards like you wouldn't believe. Um, but normally, um, when I'm building an EDH deck, I try to make the curve around the 4 or 5 mana mark. Um, and here you'll see it's very clearly at the 2 and 3 mana mark. Uh, in fact, including the commander, there's only 6 cards in the entire deck that have a converted mana cost above 5. And that's including Villainous Wealth. Um, obviously that's a CMC three, but it's X and you're never going to, you're never going to cast over three. So, um, anyway, um, a lot of the cards too, towards the higher end of the curve have either evoke or cycling or something like that. So really, you know, up there at the three, four five mark, a lot of those cards move down even farther, um, just because you're almost never going to cast them for their full converted mana cost. So, um, this is what the deck looks like. Uh, I'll just sort of uh, break it down and sort of go category by category and we'll see what the overall strategy and synergies are. All right, so uh, my current uh, iteration of this deck runs 37 lands. Uh, two of those don't produce mana. Uh, you've got Dark Depths and you've got um, Glacial Chasm. So really I've got 35 mana producing lands, but there's a lot of other ways uh, to get mana as well. Um, so I'm just going to sort of run through the mana first and we'll see what that looks like. Now, first of all, um, I run a lot of fetch lands in this deck. Uh, obviously fetch lands are great in any deck, but they're absolutely amazing here. Uh, they will get you what you need to fix your mana base, and they thin your deck of lands. Uh, but you can also regrow them once Maldrotha hits to effectively always hit your land drops. Um, you can build this deck without them and still be okay, but they add an unbelievable amount of consistency. Uh, I run a full set of nine fetch lands here, excluding only Arid Mesa because it does not match my colors. So that's all four of the Zendikar, and then all, or four, four of the Zendikar other than Arid Mesa, and then all five of the Onslaught ones as well. Um, again, you don't have to run these. Um, you don't have to have a legacy style mana base to be competitive in Commander. Uh, but in this deck especially, it adds a ton of value. Now, um, for the next category here, I have the Dual Lands and Shock Lands. 
So uh, I don't think I need to say a whole lot about these, uh, since most people know these are good. Uh, but they obviously work very well with fetch lands. Uh, you could easily get by with different lands here, but if you happen to own these, I say if you got it, flaunt it. Put them in the deck. Um, so I've got uh, got my Bayou, Tropical Island, Underground Sea, Breeding Pool, Watery Grave, Overgrown Tomb. So there's some serious synergy in those lands. That part of the mana base will go a long way towards getting Muldrotha out and getting all your colors. Now, uh, along with these, uh, I run all three bounce lands here. So Golgari Rot Farm, Simic Growth Chamber, and Demir Aqueduct. Um, these are essential. Um, not only do you get two colors each, but they are free card advantage on land. Uh, it's easy to take these for granted since they've been around for a while, uh, but they are really kind of crazy when you think about it. Uh, plus, they're budget friendly. Uh, you've got no excuses. You should play these in every commander deck that can run them. Um, these might seem like an odd inclusion, uh, but they're in here for a very specific reason. Uh, first of all, uh, if you get Tezzeret out um, or Trinket Mage, uh, they can be fetched. Um, so it gives you a couple more options to fix your mana if you absolutely need to. Uh, they can also be used to, uh, you know, double land from your graveyard once you have something that lets you play an extra land a turn. Um, so you could play a land from your hand... Um, or, excuse me, you could play a land from your graveyard, and then you could play one of these as your artifact for the turn from your graveyard as well. So um, they can sort of accelerate you out uh, if you need to at that point. Um, they're a little bit more vulnerable lands, uh, but I do think the payoff is more than worth it. Uh, these might also seem kind of odd at first, um, but it is nice to have the option to draw a card sometimes, especially when you can just play them from your graveyard later. So... Um, it kind of sucks that they come in tapped, um, but really, I mean, you're paying one, you're discarding them, you're drawing a card, and then if you have Muldrotha out, you can just play them out of your graveyard. So, I mean, they're they're, they're really, I, I think they're worth it. I, I don't ever regret having these in the deck. Um, Command Tower, right? I don't think I need to say much here. Um, if you've got two or more colors in your Commander deck, you don't really have an excuse to run to not run Command Tower. Uh, they're cheap, they're great, it's one of the most helpful lands in the deck, put it in. Um, now, as far as basic lands go, um, I run two of each basic land in this build. Um, I've been known to run one of each instead, but I think that's a little greedy these days, now that Assassin's Trophy and Path to Exile exist. Uh, plus, having more basic lands just gives you more utility out of cards like Sakura Tribe Elder and Solemn Simulacrum. Um, it might even be worth running more here, uh, but six seems to work pretty well. I don't often run out of basic lands, uh, or if I do, it's at the point where it really doesn't even matter that much anymore. Um, all right, now uh, Dryad Arbor. Um, this card is a little narrow, uh, but there are times where you really want to have a creature land. Uh, it works similarly to the artifact lands in that you can double land from your graveyard later in the game. Um, and you can also get it with a fetch land, which is really cool. Getting a creature with a fetch land just kind of feels awesome. Um, the biggest benefit is that you can kill it with Skull Clamp, uh, providing yet another card draw engine uh, should you start to stall. Um, so you can just play Dryad Arbor out of your graveyard, clamp it, draw two cards. So one mana, draw two cards, and you can do that every single turn. It's pretty decent. Um, certainly not essential to the strategy of the deck, uh, but it can be very useful at almost no cost, so I, I don't think there's a reason to not put it in. Uh, Bajookabog. Let's talk about this card. Uh, so this card will absolutely wreck any decks that rely on their graveyard, uh, especially with the ability to recur this multiple times. There are often situations where this card will straight up win you the game. Uh, most decks have at least some interaction with the graveyard, so even if you aren't up against a dedicated graveyard strategy, it's almost always going to give you some value. Um, but if, if you're up against someone that needs to dump stuff into their graveyard and you can sort of get into the cycle of playing this, exiling the graveyard, finding a way to kill it, and then just bringing it back, I mean, there's just not a lot they can do. Um, like, unless they can get it out of your graveyard, I mean, they're just gonna, they're just not gonna have a graveyard. It's fantastic. Now, Wasteland. Uh, I seriously debated putting this card in just because it's so unfair. Um, I should probably just go all or nothing and make this strip mine, but I just can't bring myself to do it. 
Uh, if you're the type of person to do uh, to do so, you can consistently recur this to decimate your opponent's mana base. Although be prepared to earn yourself a permanent reputation as that guy. I personally play this card to deal with problem lands like Maids of Ith or Cavern of Souls, which is why I'm okay with Wasteland over Strip Mine. Um, even so, just the presence of this card in your deck will make many people hate you, even if you're being responsible with it. Uh, again, I think it's worth the inclusion, but put this in at your own risk. Um, yeah, make up your own mind on that one. All right. Command Beacon. This card was such a huge gift to this deck when they printed it. If you can draw this before you get to six mana, you can almost guarantee that you'll never pay more than six from Muldrotha. They can kill her as many times as they want, but you can just sack the tower, cast her from your hand, and then play the tower again from your graveyard. Um, I think this card is amazing in a lot of decks, but it really goes nuts in Muldrotha. Um, don't underestimate that card. It's awesome. All right, next up, Glacial Chasm. Um, I know it's not technically mana, but it's a land, so I'll talk about it here. Um, I hated this card for a very long time. Uh, it just seems like such a bad deal for a few turns apiece. Um, but with Mel Meldrotha, it really sort of changes the equation. Uh, sacrificing a land is not a bad deal, since you can just play it again from the graveyard, and Community of Upkeep is no longer a problem, since you just let it die and play it again. Um, it especially gets abusive if you can play multiple lands in turn, since you don't ever have to pay the upkeep and you can maintain your mana base. Um, if your opponent doesn't have uh, land destruction or a way to exile it from your graveyard, a lot of times you just win, or I guess technically can't lose, which ends up being the same thing. Um, this is one of the dirtier tricks in the deck, and, and again, this is, this is a card that might make people at the table hate you. Um, it also is the kind of card that's going to make other people at the table start running their own strip mine and uh, wasteland and things like that. So, again, just sort of be prepared for the hate if you put that in. And uh, speaking of dirty, we've got our buddy Dark Depths here. So, uh, this deck already wanted to run Vampire Hex Mage just so you can kill Planeswalkers whenever you want to. So why not get a 2020 flying indestructible creature out of the deal, right? Um, it's especially crazy because even if your opponents find a way to deal with Merit Lage, you can just pay two mana and make another token. Uh, this is one of the more common uh, ways that this deck will end up winning, um, just because it's such a simple combo and it's so hard to deal with. All right, so that's it for the lands. Let's start talking about some of the spells that uh, help us with our mana in this deck. All right, so we got our buddy Lion Eye Diamond, Lion's Eye Diamond. Um, in this deck, this is basically just running Black Lotus. Uh, if you can protect Maldrotha, discarding your hand has almost zero downside. Um, you can, I mean, if you get this late game, you're just going to go crazy and you'll be able to cast whatever you want. Um, but if you get it early, you can attempt to go off early too, which is kind of fun. Um, it's a little risky, but you can do like, you know, turn one Stitcher Supplier, turn two Lightning Greaves, and then turn three Maldrotha. Like that's just, if they can't immediately remove Maldrotha in response to the equip, like you're just, you're just kind of golden at that point. Um, you've got all the mana you'd ever need, you've got some stuff in your graveyard already, and you've got a giant, untargetable 6-6. Six, six. So, yeah, that's that's one of the ways this deck can go crazy pretty early. So, Lion's Eye Diamond's pretty cool. Uh, we've got Mox Diamond as well. Um, so, this is another card where the downside is almost 100% mitigated. Um, ideally, you're going to either discard Glacial Chasm or Dark Depths, but even if you have to discard a land that does tap for mana... You can always just play it from the graveyard later. Uh, that being said, this is nowhere near as powerful as Lion's Eye Diamond and could be cut without much problem if you don't own one. But um, as I said, with the dual lands, if you got it, flaunt it. It's a great card. Uh, we got Soul Ring. Uh, I mean, it's it's EDH. Run your Soul Ring. I don't really have a lot else to say about that one. Uh, Expedition Map is a pretty cool card in this deck. Uh, there's a lot of lands in this deck that either combo off or act as a toolbox. Worst case scenario, you just use it to fix your mana. Uh, but this is usually going to get Dark Depths, Glacial Chasm, Bajuka Bog, Dried Arbor, Command Beacon, Wasteland, etc. Um, this is more of a toolbox card than a fixer, just because it's a little ponderous in terms of mana. But um, it's, it's versatile too, so it's a good card. 
All right, uh, we've got exploration. Uh, this seems fairly innocuous at first, but this is one of the most dangerous cards in the deck, especially if you get an early game. Um, it's not uncommon to hit uh, six mana turn three if you get it early, especially if you draw one or more bounce lands. Um, and if you get it late game, you can just start playing fetch lands from your graveyard. If you run a lands in your hand, Muldrotha even lets you choose an artifact. Is uh, artifact land is your artifact for the turn, or Dried Arbor is your creature for the turn, allowing you to double land from your graveyard. Um, if you want to be really inconsiderate, you can even start regrowing and sacrificing wasteland and continuing to develop your own mana base. That's not something I usually do because that really, really sucks to be on the receiving end of, and I want my friends to want to continue to play me. Um, but your mileage may vary, you know? You make your own game, you make your own fate, you decide whether or not your friends are important to you. But exploration, don't count it out. It's a pretty good card. All right, Life from the Loam. Uh, this is another card that's kind of easy to overlook, but in practice is absolutely essential. Um, it helps you get your land drops early by getting back uh, sacrifice fetch lands or milled or discarded lands. Uh, it's often worth playing it, even if it only gets you one or two lands back. Uh, once it's in your graveyard, dredging three cards is almost the same thing as drawing three once you have Muldroth out, too. Um, this is also one of the main reasons I play the three Onslaught Cycling Lands. Um, as you can create a card draw loop by cycling them and then getting them back with Light from the Loam. It's a little mana intensive, but if you fizzle, you can, you can draw out of it pretty quickly. So um, that's just kind of a backdoor that's built in in case you don't have any other options. Uh, we've got our Sakura Tribe Elder. This is one of my favorite commons of all time. It's just a great card. Um, it's also a pretty obvious inclusion. Um, nothing beats an early chump block with an attached rampant growth at no additional mana cost. Um, it's just very cheap, very versatile. It does exactly what you'd expect out of it. Perfect card. Uh, this is another one of my favorites too, Coiling Oracle. Uh, this is just a great deal no matter how you look at it. Um, you're either going to accelerate your mana, um, and it comes in untapped even, which is pretty sweet, um, or you get to draw a card. Uh, it's low cost, also makes it a good cantrip uh, to cast from your graveyard later if you happen to end up with a couple extra mana. So um, I, I really, really like this card. All right, um, I run a Mind Stone in here. Um, this could pretty easily be replaced by either Commander Sphere or Hedron Archive. Uh, but I personally prefer Mind Stone in the deck, uh, mostly because of the low converted mana cost. Um, not only uh, is it an early game accelerant, but it's easy to regrow and cycle for a card later on. Um, in fact, if you look at Commander Sphere, if you're if you're looking to just draw cards with this, it's three mana either way. Uh, but this comes down to turn earlier, um, and even though it does produce a colorless instead of a mana of any color, um, I don't know. It, our, our mana fixing is pretty good in this deck. Um, I think Mind Stone is the correct choice personally. Now, Realms Uncharted. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do in Commander is to find uh, either bad or underpowered cards or just cards that people don't ever play um, and find situations where they're a little OP. Um, and I think this is one of the situations. Uh, normally, you would just be throwing away two good lands to get two sort of inferior lands, um, but Muldrotha, again, kind of changed the equation there. Uh, early on, I'm usually either going to get all three bounce lands and usually something like Command Beacon uh, or Command Tower maybe even to secure my land drops. Um, but you can also get the cycling lands to set up your life from the Loam engine uh, or just pick and choose out of your toolbox. Um, yeah, and, and if you have Muldrotha out, it's, it's, it doesn't even matter. Like, it doesn't matter what they pick. You're just going to get it back. So um, you're going to see sort of a, uh, variations on that theme going throughout this deck a little bit too. We got good old Bill Murray here, Yavimaya Elder. Um, this is kind of similar to Soccer Tribe Elder, except it obviously costs more. Um, draws you more cards, gets you more lands. Fairly obvious. Um, it's a good card for the deck. Don't really have a lot more to say about that one. All right, Chromatic Lantern. Uh, this is another seemingly harmless card, but it's crazy good the longer the game draws on. Um, you eventually will get to the point where there are either no lands left in your deck to fetch, or you just don't feel like paying life anymore. Um, and then you can just use Chromatic Lantern and tap your fetch lands for mana, which is kind of cool. Um, it also lets you turn Glacial Chasm and Dark Depths into mana producers, which shouldn't be underestimated either. Uh, the fact that it accelerates and fixes your mana is just gravy on top. This card's amazing. Um, it's 
it's I mean, it's really good in any deck that you can run it in. But again, especially if you have lands that don't tap for mana, like fetch lands, like Glacial Chasm, this card's great. I love it. All right. Uh, World Shaper. Uh, this card's pretty busted, too. Um, you will necessarily end up with lots of lands in your graveyard, either from sacrificing fetch lands, milling yourself, discarding in various ways, um, or even just by casting things like Realms Uncharted or Factor Fiction. Um, he will obviously start to mill your deck as well, uh, which with Maldrotha out is essentially like drawing more cards. Uh, early game, the best bet is probably to kill him as fast as you can to accelerate your mana. Uh, but late game, you should try to keep him alive and attacking for card advantage. Uh, it's really win-win easy, um, and then you can just cast him again anyway. Uh, with how affordable this card is, every version of this deck should run it. It's great. I can't underestimate how good this card is. All right, and we got our sad robot, Drew Carey, Solemn Simulacrum here. Um, this should be pretty obvious for the same reasons as Sakura Tribe Elder and Yavimaya Elder. Um, I'd place it somewhere between the two in terms of efficiently, uh, efficiency and power level. Um, it is really nice, though, just because it's colorless mana. So if you get four mana of any color, it just comes down, gets you what you're missing, dies, draws a card. Uh, I mean... There are very few EDH decks that don't want to run the Sad Robot. Um, this is certainly one that wants it. I love that card. All right. And finally, we've got Crozen Tusker. This is another one of my personal favorites. Um, it's just a, it's a cool card. I think it's one of the better cycling cards. Um, it essentially functions like an instant speed divination, um, but one of the cards is always a basic land. Um, so, I don't know. It's kind of cool. Um... You can technically play it out of your graveyard later if you need to and get a 6-5 beater, but I don't think I've ever actually done that. Um, this is mainly just a mana fixer. This may be one of the least essential parts of the deck, but this is a personal favorite of mine. All right, next we're going to look at uh, the card draw in the deck uh, slash mill, because really they end up being about the same. So first off, we're going to do a weird one. Uh, I've got Mystic Remora from Ice Age. Um, so this fills a very similar role to something like Ristic Study. Uh, and in fact, you can make the argument that Ristic Study is better. Um, however, a Mystic Remora costs one mana, um, and your opponent is almost never going to want to pay an extra four mana, whereas you will often find people uh, more than willing to pay the one for Ristic Study and just deny you the card draw. Um, you can also just let Mystic Remora die the second time uh, and ask you to pay its upkeep and just cast it from the graveyard for cheaper. Um, so again, the cumulative upkeep really isn't that big of a deal. Uh, Ristic Study never asks you to pay the upkeep cost at all, though, and triggers off all spells, not just non-creature spells, so it's really a personal choice. Um, I personally like Mystic Remora as well, just because when else are you going to play this card? Like, it's kind of a stupid card, but in this deck it works. So um, I think that is maybe what pushes it over the edge for me. Um, but who knows? You know, if you're in a big game, you can chuck this down in turn one if you go first and then draw cards off people's soul rings and stuff. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. So, but your mileage may vary. All right. Um, Stitcher Supplier. This should be pretty obvious when you're building this deck. This is a pretty good card. Um, so it's, it's really great no matter when you draw it, which is kind of unusual for a one drop, uh, which I guess is why it's in there. Um, but this deck is at its most explosive when you can get this down early. Like, if you get this down turn one, you just get so much advantage and so many options. Um, that being said, you can also combo this with Skull Clamp, um, or even something like Rasko Gari Queen later in the game. Um, and you can start generating massive amounts of card advantage per turn, since, again, milling yourself with an active Maldrotha is almost the same as drawing cards. So really, imagine a situation late game, this is in your graveyard... One mana comes down, you mill for three. One mana equips the Skull Clamp, you draw two and mill for three. So you're paying two mana, one black, one colorless, and you're gaining access to eight more cards. Um, I mean, you could, you, if you're not careful, you could even just mill yourself down to nothing and lose the game. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's insane how much value this card gets you. So it's an uncommon, it's in standard, no excuses, pick it up, put it in the deck. 
Uh, another uh, cheapy but a pretty good card is the Vessel of Nascency. Um, it's great again, no matter when you draw it. Um, it usually will grab your relevant card off the top of your deck and it fills up your graveyard. So uh, again, this one, um, the advantage over something like Stitcher Supplier is this just does the trick by itself. You don't need a second card to keep killing it and regrowing it. Um, it's just three mana and four cards in the graveyard or in, in your hand. It's pretty good. Uh, we already talked about this one a little bit, and uh, I mean, this should be no surprise. Uh, Skull Clamp is one of the most un uh, most powerful uncommons that's ever been printed, bar none. Uh, there are enough one toughness creatures in this deck that you will almost always have a target to clamp. Um, if it's something like Stitcher Supplier, Baleful Strix, Coiling Oracle, uh, so much the better, but you can still use something like Sakura Tribe Elder in a pinch. Um, if you have a sack outlet like uh, Vraska, you can even clamp up Solemn Simulacrum or World Shaper and sack that and draw cards from this in addition to what you'd normally be drawing. So, again, Skull Clamp should be in a lot of commander decks, and this is definitely one of them. All right, um, we've got our Baleful Strix. Uh, draws a card, it has flying, it has death touch. Um, it's really hard to beat the value that the two mana gets you here. Um, basically, it just tells everybody to attack someone else because you're going to kill their best attacker. If you can stick this early game, um, you're going to be able to develop your board and they're just not really going to be able to do much to you. Um, plus, really, how many people you do you know that want to waste a removal spell in a 1-1? It's just, it's not likely to happen unless it's incidental. So, um, again, it's an excellent card for this particular deck. We've got our Search for Ascanta here. Um, again, I don't think I really need to say a whole lot about this card. Um, it slowly fills up your graveyard, and I mean really slowly, but it does. Um, and then it accelerates your mana, and you get extra card draw whenever you want it. It's it's good. I mean, you know it's good. You've seen this card. It's in standard again, so um, it's a good card. Now, Intuition. I almost didn't put this in this particular section just because it's not really card draw. Um, it's it's basically like a triple demonic tutor. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's blue, so I guess it made its way into the section. So um, this card is usually just going to give the opponent a damned if you do, damned if you don't choice. So like normally when you're when you're playing this card and you don't have a way to abuse your graveyard, you just get three removal spells and they just give you one of them. Uh, but in this deck, it's basically, like I said, just instant speed, triple demonic tutor. Um, this will very commonly get something like Dark Depths and Vampire Hex Mage, and then just whatever else. Um, but you can use it really to get anything you want. You just pick three cards and you probably just get to have them all. Um, this is also, just as a note, one of my favorite magic cards of all time. Um... I just love playing with this card, and this is possibly its best deck, I think, at least in Commander. So that was going to be in no matter what as soon as I knew I was playing, playing blue. All right, Secrets of the Dead. We got another really good uncommon here. So um, it just straight up draws you a crap ton of cards. Um, it doesn't really do anything by itself, which is the only problem. You know, you play it, and then nothing happens until you play another card. Um, but once you get Muldrotha going, it's very easy to draw an extra three plus cards every single turn. So, um, again, I think this is part of the reason why Ristic Study didn't make it, because this is already the same cost as Ristic Study, and I wanted something cheaper in there. So, Mystic Remora and Secrets of the Dead went in the deck. We got Factor Fiction. Again, we're playing blue. You should ex have expected this to come up at some point. So similar to Intuition, it doesn't really matter how they separate the cards into piles because you just end up with access to pretty much everything. Um, so for all intents and purposes, this is basically four mana, uh, instant speed draw five cards. Can't really argue with that. We've got our Mall Drifter here. So uh, Evoke is absolutely broken with Muldrotha. Um, you can evoke from the graveyard since it's an alternate casting cost. So if Muldrotha, or if Muldrifter is in your graveyard, you can essentially just cast Divination whenever you want, except it doesn't cost you a card. So it's really like drawing three cards when you think about it, since, yeah, it's good. It's a really good card. So, um, and again, it technically costs five. Um, you could cast it for five if you really wanted to, but that doesn't happen too often. You just... Draw your cards and move on. But it's there if you need it. All right. We've got our Underrealm Lich. So 
I really underestimated this card the first couple of times I saw it. And then the first time I played with it, I realized how good this was. So um, it's got a decently sized body, serves, uh, survives board wipe, uh, makes your graveyard absolutely massive. Um, if you don't win the game after having this guy around for more than a turn or two, something is going extremely wrong. Like this card is just, it's just really good. And paying four life to give him indestructible, it's almost always worth it. You, you want him around as much as possible. Speaking of which, our good friend Jace here is absolutely bonkers with Underrealm Rich and Lich in play. So his Brainstorm ability uh, will not only do its usual trick, but it will dump six cards into the graveyard as well, which is pretty cool. So three in your hand, six in the graveyard for free. Um, since I'm also running nine fetch lands, uh, which can be replayed out of the graveyard, it's very easy to shuffle away unneeded cards. Uh, Jace can also be a win condition, which this deck is surprisingly short on when you look at it. Um, there's not a lot of win conditions uh, in and of themselves, so it's, it's more than welcome. Um, the other really nice thing about Planeswalkers in this deck is you don't have to worry too much about get them getting killed. It's normally pretty hard to get a Planeswalker back from the dead, but not in this deck. You can just cast them again. So, you know, use the bounce, use the brainstorm. Um, it doesn't really matter if they attack your Jace because you just cast them again. So, yeah, Jace is cool. Uh, and then finally, um, we've got Kiora, Master of the Depths. So this is not normally one of my favorite planeswalkers um she doesn't always really do that much for you but um it's great in this deck um you can use her first ability in uh combination with dryad armor and bounce lands to make a ton of mana uh, or you can use the second ability to just draw a bunch of cards and dump the rest into the graveyard um since she only costs four mana you can just cast her again when she dies so usually when i play this if i don't already have the mana out to abuse her I'll just negative two for two turns in a row and then cast her again on the second turn and negative two again. Um, you just end up with a bunch of cards in your hand and a bunch of cards in your graveyard. It's, it's pretty good for four mana. It's not too bad. All right. So that about does it for the card draw section. Um, so I think what I'm going to do next is move on to uh, the toolbox section and just show you... Um, some of the different types of things that are in this deck that you can use to sort of gain incremental advantage and, and things like that. All right, I'm going to start this section off here with a, a kind of an unfair little card here, Gilded Drake. Uh, so Gilded Drake is usually good even if you don't immediately have a way to kill or bounce it, but in this deck it's pretty incredible. Uh, two mana lets you steal the best creature on the board, and then another small mana investment usually lets you kill it or return it to your hand, and then you just do it all over again. Um, this is also one of the only ways to deal with opposing Blightsteel Colossus or Ulamog or something indestructible that you're just having a problem with. Plus then you get to punish your opponent by hitting them with it. So yeah, Gilded Drake is really, really good. All right, we've got Animate Dead, um, which kind of fills a similar role. Um, in that two mana will let you take a creature from any graveyard. Um, the negative one, negative zero is not really that big of a deal uh, compared to the cheap two mana converted mana cost. Uh, normally reanimate spells are weaker as auras since a creature dies when the aura dies, which also helps bring that mana cost down. Uh, but in this case, reusability more than makes up for it. Um, if you hit something with Animate Dead, comes onto your board, they kill either Animate Dead or they kill the creature. This just goes to your graveyard and you just cast it again on something else. So um, again, the reusability factor is, is really key for a lot of these cards. We've got Vampire Hex Mage, which we already talked about a little bit here. Um, this not only kills Planeswalkers, which it would be in here anyway for doing that, but it also serves as a win condition combined with Dark Depths. Um, you sacrifice the Hex Mage, target the Dark Depths, all the counters fall off, and then you get your 2020 Flying Indestructible. Um, so, yeah, it's a pretty good combo. Um, you can obviously also use this to hit some other targets and take some counters off, which will sometimes be useful, but it's usually going to either kill Planeswalkers or make a huge creature. Uh, next up we have Seal of Primordium, which is basically just a reusable naturalize. Uh, there's not a lot to say other than it's great. Uh, next up, we've got Tormod's Crypt. So this card's really good. Um, just like Bajuka Bog, uh, but slightly better, I would say. 
Uh, this card will sometimes just win you the game. If your opponents are relying on graveyard strategies, this blanks their entire game plan. Um, the reason I think this is better than Bajuka Bog is with Bajuka Bog, you play the card and it immediately takes out the graveyard. But with this, you just keep it on the board until you need to use it. So if nobody has anything that's threatening in their graveyard, you just play the card down. And then as soon as someone tries to reanimate something with, like, Anime Dead, in response, you sacrifice the crypt and the whole graveyard goes away. Um, the other nice thing, too, is you can just immediately play it sacrifice it, bring it back. Uh, with Bajuka Bog, you need another card to sacrifice it so you can replay it. So Tormod's Crypt, absolutely a powerhouse in this deck. We've got Liliana of the Veil. Uh, Lily does a lot of work, I think. So the discard doesn't really bother you at all since your graveyard is basically just a second hand. Uh, Non-targeted removal is always useful, and the final ability is just gross. Um, I've, I've gotten the final ability off a couple of times, and it's it's just fun. <laughs> I just love it. Um, she also combos with Life from the Loam in a pretty spectacular fashion. Um, use her plus one, discard Life, and then dredge it back every single turn to mill yourself for three. So you jump really far ahead, and everybody else falls behind. Um, you shouldn't be too afraid of using the negative two either, since you can just cast her again for three mana if she dies. Again, it's a little awkward since she starts at three loyalty and it costs negative two, so you can't just do the same thing you can do with Kiora, just negative, negative, recast. Um, but again, it doesn't really matter if she dies. You just cast her again. So use that negative two all you want. Now... Speaking of sack outlets, this obviously doesn't work with uh, Bajuka Bog, but this deck occasionally needs a sacrifice outlet for things like Stitcher Supplier, World Shaper, Thrag Tusk, Worm Coil Engine, Solemn Simulacrum, um, anything with a Skull Clamp attached. So I say, why not kill a creature at the same time? Um, as long as your opponent is not playing black, attrition makes life very difficult for them. Um, it's also a great deterrent card, since anyone who tries to kill your creatures can pretty much rely on losing one of their own, too. So, again, this is one of those cards where if you just leave some mana up, it kind of makes your opponents think twice about messing with you. All right, um, and this kind of goes back to Gilded Drake. That's one of the combos in the deck. Uh, sometimes you just need to bounce something. Um, and one mana is about what you want to pay for that ability. Um, this is another great way to make someone reconsider attacking you, especially if they have a go tall strategy. Uh, if they can see right there in the board that their creature will just end up back in their hand, it's probably going to stomp your opponents instead. Um, so, I mean, I know I know a lot of people don't play like auras and stuff unless it's on a hexproof creature, but if you can get into that kind of a situation, seal of removal does a lot of work. So, otherwise, you just you know bounce their biggest creature back and make them cast it again. On the same note, we've got Seal of Doom. Um, so this is very similar to Seal of Removal in a lot of ways. Uh, being able to spend the mana ahead of time and delay the spell effect will sometimes be enough for someone to just leave you alone. Um, in duels, surprise is usually much more important, so something like a Doomblade or Terror or something is usually going to be better. Uh, but in multiplayer games, political effects like this are very useful. So um, in other words, um, if you can just put it down on the board... Everybody knows you have it, and they know that if they do anything with you, you're just going to kill one of their creatures. Whereas opposed to something like Doomblade, if it's in your hand, I mean, you could, I guess you could tell someone that you have a Doomblade, but I mean, it's usually you're, you're playing something like Doomblade over Seal of Doom for the surprise factor. Um, but in this case, surprise factor doesn't mean much, and recastability is king. Now, I also run Executioner's Capsule um, as kind of redundancy for Seal of Doom. Um, the mana commitment is the same, uh, but you get to spread it out over two turns if you need to. Uh, I prefer Seal of Doom, but sometimes you only have one mana left to spend for a turn, and this can fit the bill nicely. Um, it's also important to note that the capsule is an artifact, and the seal is an enchantment. So you can pick and choose based on what you've already cast this turn. So if you need to cast a seal of primordium or seal of removal, um, you can, and then still cast the executioner's capsule to kill a creature. We've got Spore Frog. Uh, this card's fun, but it's also really annoying. Um, in duels, it makes it almost impossible for them to win with combat damage. In multiplayer, again, it de-incentivizes the other players from attacking you. 
Um, you can also use it politically to make deals with other players by preventing damage to them in exchange for things you need, but that's usually not going to be the main use of this card. This guy just comes down and says, you can't really attack me unless you gang up on me, which sometimes happens. But Sporefrog's pretty cool. I like Sporefrog. We've also got Plague Crafter. So it's more non-targeted removal, but it also hits Planeswalkers and cards in hand. Um, this will usually sacrifice itself, but sometimes you have a better option like World Shaper. So just pay attention to the board. Uh, you do have to be a little careful though, because if you play this with no other creatures on the board and they kill it in response to the ETB trigger, you might end up sacrificing a Planeswalker or discarding from your hand. So um, again, just be a little, little careful with this card, but it, it does a lot of work. Next up, we've got Wonder. Uh, you almost never want to play this card, but if you do, make sure you have a Sacrifice Outlet handy. As you might expect, this belongs in your graveyard. This deck has plenty of ways to make you discard or mill it, though, so enjoy your wings. All right, and we've got Hostage Taker. This card can be great, but it does require some finesse. You don't want to exile something that you can't cast right away. Otherwise, they will just very likely get it back while you're tapped out. Uh, early game, this will steal mana rocks and things like that. Late game, you can start going after bigger stuff. You can also exile tokens with no repercussions. So if a big token is threatening the board, this may be a good solution. We've got Treachery. Um, this is another one of those cards that I just absolutely love. Uh, beyond its obvious use, Treachery will often act its mana acceleration. So if you have bounce lands in play, uh, you get to net one mana for each one when you untap. Being able to cast a free spell from your graveyard is huge, too, as it lets you double or triple spell pretty easily. Uh, if you combine this with Secrets of the Dead, you can gain major advantage. Plus, obviously, you get to steal something awesome. We got Shriek Maw. So, more single target removal with the Summon a Creature. Um, you don't often hard cast this spell, but it's nice to have the option in case you need a blocker or something. We got our Thrag Tusk. So um, this deck ends up costing you a lot of life sometimes, um, especially with your mana base, running all those fetch lands and shock lands and stuff. This will hopefully offset that a little. Um, if you can get into a cycle of sacrifice and recast, you'll be in pretty good shape. Um, this is one of the better cards to draw uh, when, you're, when you're falling behind. And we've got our shiny Avatar of Woe here. So eight man is a little much, but thankfully you won't pay that very often. In big games, this basically just becomes a two drop. Uh, keep her back and pick off targets or swing big with evasion. This is a classic card that finds a very good home here. We've got our Trinket Mage. Uh, Trinket Mage is a personal favorite of mine. You can either get Soul Ring or an Artifact Land or Mox Diamond if you need fixing. More than Acceleration, you can get Skull Clamp for card draw, you can get Tormod's Crypt for graveyard hate, you get Expedition Map, you need a key land, Executioner's Capsule for removal, or you can get Lion's Eye Diamond for big mana shenanigans. This goes in almost every blue deck I design, and again, in this deck, it's absolutely fantastic. Speaking of personal favorites, uh, this is close to the top for me. Um, it does everything Trick and Mage does, but you can scale the ability. So if you need Lightning Greaves, great. Chromatic Lantern, no problem. The other thing is the untap ability. Once you get a couple of artifact mana sources in play, you can start to generate an absurd amount of mana. Um, I don't think this deck needs Mana Vault or Grim Monolith. Excellent with it as well. And finally, we got our buddy Demonic Tutor here. Um, I tried to keep instants and sorceries to a minimum since they cannot be replayed with Maldrotha, but cards like this are just too good to exclude. This gets you anything you need for cheap. This is just hard to go wrong. Plus, again, you got the classic factor. With all the planning, sometimes stuff just goes wrong, so we've got some board wipe in here. We start off with Pernicious Deed. So it's great for clearing the board in its entirety or great for just taking out lower CMC permanents once Maldrotha is down. You don't really have to worry as much about your own mana rocks since you can just cast them again. I mean, it's, you know, everybody else loses their soul ring and you just pay one and keep yours. So 
Um, along with Nevenural's disc, it's a great deterrent to have down since you can threaten to blow it up if someone attacks you. Um, also, it should be noted, Pernicious Deed is a silver bullet against token decks. You just pay zero and they just they just all die. It's great. So um, that's a pretty good card. Be careful with your artifact mana, though, too, because, again, it's, it's not non-land permanence. It's artifact, creature, and enchantment would convert a mana cost X or less. So just be a little careful when you play that one. We've got our Nevenural's Disc. Um, this will hurt you considerably when it goes off, but the advantage um, that you have is how much easier it is for you to rebuild than it is for everyone else. Um, the disc is best used right before you cast Muldrotha or once you're ever equipped with Dark Steel Plate. Uh, the, la the latter combo is downright abusive. You just, you know, obviously pay one, tap it, blow everything up except for Muldrotha and Dark Steel Plate, and then you immediately cast it again. Um, and you just do that every turn. So for five mana, you just clear everything out that doesn't belong to you. Um, next up, we have the Phyrexian Scriptures, which, uh, again, I sort of underestimated when I first saw it, but I really like this card. Um, this works slowly, but it also works hard. Uh, the first time around, you can blow up nearly everybody except Maldrotha, then nuke everybody else's graveyards. Then you can recast it and protect another one of your creatures before blowing up the world all over again. Uh, this acts as more of a control strategy than a reactive board wipe due to the delay. So make sure your board can fend off your pissed off opponents the first time you cast it, or you'll find yourself getting beaten down. I kind of put this in the same category with the disc, in that these aren't really reactive spells. These are more uh, controlly um, strategies in and of themselves. Because um, you can't, it doesn't really do anything to the board the turn you cast it. Um, but if you can recur these a couple of times, you're going to be in, in a really good position. Um, we also have Knight Incarnate, which is a newer card, and I thought it went really well in this deck. Um, you can't go wrong with any Evoke card. Like, I, I think, honestly, any card that fits these colors that has Evoke is worth considering. Um, but reusable board wipe is, is pretty good to have. Um, I mean, I suppose you could also hard cast it if you wanted a death touch 3-4 as well, but that probably isn't going to happen very often. Uh, but again, it's nice to have the option. It only costs one more. So again, I, I put this more towards Pernicious Deed. These, these are the more reactive cards that just get you out of a jam and work immediately. And these ones take a turn to have the effect. So six mana is a lot, um, especially for a commander um, that needs to stay in play. So um, we've got a couple of protective measures in here to make sure that once you pay your six mana, your engine stays in, in, in the battlefield. So um, obviously we're going to put Lightning Greaves in the stack. Um, this is pretty much in most of my commander decks, and I don't think I'm uh, I, I don't think I'm in the minority there. I think most people play Lightning Greaves. Um, this obviously would ideally come down before Maldrotha, as keeping her in play is very important to the deck's strategy. Similarly, Swiftfoot Boots. So if you get the Boots instead of the Greaves, it is almost always worth it to wait until you have 7 mana to cast Maldrotha. That way you can attempt to protect her right away. Um, you want to give your opponents the smallest window of opportunity possible to use removal, otherwise you're back to square one. Um, and then... Similarly to that, you've got the Dark Steel Plate. Um, if this is the only piece you draw, wait until you get, uh, you know, eight mana to cast Muldrotha. Um, just because, again, you want to try to equip it right away. Um, if you can manage to equip both this and either the Boots or the Greaves, you can pretty much assure that she'll live long enough for you to take over the board. Although usually one of these pieces is going to uh, suffice. So... Um, Again, these are all tutorable. You want to get one of them down first. You don't have to, but the more players are at the table, the higher chance that she's just going to get nuked as soon as she hits uh, exists. So try to get one of these. So how does this deck actually win? Um, that's a good question. So other than just... Uh, gaining advantage and taking your opponent's stuff. 
um, there are a few cards in here that are capable of winning the game all on their own. Uh, Lord of Extinction is one such card. Um, so this swings for big damage, especially in multiplayer games. Uh, if you can get Wonder in the graveyard uh, and then maybe get something like Lightning Greaves, you can just, for five mana, surprise somebody right out of the game. Uh, obviously, everybody you kill with this makes him a little bit smaller, um, but considering the amount of cards you should be putting in your own graveyard, he gets pretty big and he's usually going to stay pretty big. Um, we also have the Gitrog Monster. Um, he gets the extra lands, card draw, sacrifice outlet for things like Bajuka Bog, um, and a huge death touch body, and it's only five mana. Um, it, it interacts incredibly well with fetch lands. Um, we've got nine of those in the deck, and again, we can cast them from the graveyard. So um, you're going to draw a lot of cards by doing that. Um, this should win you the game very quickly if your opponents can't answer it. And even if they can, you just pull it out of the graveyard again. Villainous Wealth. So this might seem like an unusual choice for this deck, just because it doesn't really have any obvious synergy. Uh, you can't recast it from the graveyard. There's nothing in here like Eternal Witness to get it back. Um, but this card is in here um, specifically because you end up with a ton of mana in this deck. Um, and you can gen wave your opponent's deck, and that will usually give you enough advantage to become a major threat out of nowhere. Um, you know, you usually want to hit this for at least five or six, but it's not uncommon to hit it for 10 plus. And if you can do that, I mean, just kiss everybody goodbye. It's a great card. We've got Emrakul, The Promised End. So it's huge. It's got evasion. It's got a little bit of built-in protection. Um, messes with whomever is most vulnerable when you cast it. Um, later the game goes, the cheaper it gets to, since it, it automatically reduces its casting cost. Um, I mean, it's, it's just a good card, and it wins games. We've got a Worm Coil Engine in here, too. So it's kind of similar to Thrag Tusk, but it does a better job at beating down for damage. Um, an attacking Worm Coil Engine doesn't leave your opponent with a lot of good choices, and if or when it dies, you just get two more tokens to replace it, and then you just cast it again. So... That card will get you out of a lot of jams. And we've got Vraska Golgari Queen. Um, I'm always surprised at how quick to ultimate Vraska actually is. You don't always win with her album, but it will happen a non-zero percentage of the time, especially if you can keep Glacial Chasm in play, recur mass removal, or just fog down the board with Spore Frog. Uh, even if you don't, this deck has plenty of cards that want to be sacrificed. Uh, in worst case scenario, you can kill some permanents with their minus ability. I did not expect to like this card as much as I do when I first saw the preview for it, but it has really grown on me. I really, really enjoy this card. All right, well, that's what the deck looks like. Uh, this video is running a little bit longer than I thought it would, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a part two uh, where I explore um, some alternate cards uh, alternate strategies for the deck even that you could use if you're not a fan of the strategy that I've laid out here. Uh, some budget options and just some cards that almost made the cut and then didn't for whatever reason. Um, so I, I think that's the way I'm going to do it, kind of split it up a little bit. Um, so, But in any case, uh, if you enjoyed this video, uh, do all the internet, social media stuff, click the things, turn the things on, Share it with all your friends, watch it a thousand times, whatever you want to do. Uh, or just watch it once and enjoy it. But whatever the case, I want to thank you guys for watching. Um, let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll be back with part two.